Hello, I'm a mom from Massachusetts who has experienced abuse from a child. We have never had authorities recognize that. Um, we have been treated as the criminals and children are the ones who end up suffering the most because they do not get what they need in this whole process. Um, I'll back up a little bit and say that adoption had always been on our hearts, knowing that there are so many children without families and without care or an advocate is very weighty. We truly love children and have spent the majority of our married life serving children in some capacity or another. After having several, giving birth to several children, doing foster care and working with other children in various other capacities, it didn't appear that adoption would perhaps be in our future until the Lord suddenly brought that along one day. After doing foster care and in various ways we had served children, we had seen kind of the gamut of issues and challenges that there can be. However, I don't know is there's anything that could have quite prepared us for what we we're about to encounter. We adopted a child with no English language skills, no understanding of English, that had come from a background which can truly only be described as horrific. And trying to care for a child who had experienced a failed adoption by another family was truly more challenging than we ever could have imagined. The state had failed this child when the first adoptive parents refused to take them home from a therapeutic setting. The adoption agencies had failed this child when they were more concerned with their reputation than with helping the family or helping this child find a suitable home. Therapists all along the way that this child had been seen by failed. Um, and my child was completely against talking with anyone at this point. Uh, at every turn, therapists and um, people who were supposed to help were thrown in front of them. And at every turn, those people completely failed them and made things worse. We worked with them diligently and painstakingly. The first year was challenging as my child was easily kicked into fight or flight mode. Being um, seven years old at the age that um, we began and having had no parenting or any care for most of their life. It was very sad. My child was very athletic, so athleticism prevailed and an outlet was found for that. English was slowly learned and the walls came down a bit. Um, success in sports became the drive. That was kind of the the push behind my child's existence. We supported that and it also became our daily life. Um, things always though were still a bit challenging, um, but we did seem to be finding some sort of normal, if you can call it that. Um, I don't know with children that have experienced great trauma, I'm not sure there ever is what most people would consider normal. There was a routine, but there was still struggle. After a few years when success in sports wasn't as easy and didn't come as simply as it had before, we could see more challenges popping back up again. Um, a couple of bouts of stealing, um, doing foolish things to gain attention from teammates, lying, um, kind of always want, almost wanting to fight, all began to emerge more heavily. Schoolwork had also become a great challenge, even though there was great intellectual ability there. Um, the focus and the desire was not. Um, verbal and physical abuse, things like kicking, scratching, hitting, 
were sort of present all along if certain things didn't go their way. However, I think we we're trying to give space and allow for growth and learning um, and work with them and, and know that you know, each day is a new day and, we'll, and we'll, we'll start each day anew. After a time, as the teen years approached, the physical abuse became great. When my husband would walk out the door, I was a target. Our younger children were a target. All they had to do was hum when someone else didn't want them to hum or simply be present and they would be a target. I began to use my body to step in between or to kind of cover the younger children to keep them from getting hurt. So it was very common that I was the one often covered in bruises on my arms, on my chest, on my legs. I would be hit with an elbow or a fist in the back of my head. Mostly things that would never be seen by anyone else unless I were to take off my clothing. Holes in the walls, furniture, being banged or thrown. Um, anytime something wasn't their way, you never knew what was going to erupt. We learned early on that our local police were not trauma informed or adoptive, adoption informed and that we could not count on them for support. Upon several occasions, we called the police as our child was so out of control, we felt we needed help. And as soon as the police would arrive, our child would completely calm himself as if he had been the one abused, claim we had done things we had not. And the police were very adamant that they couldn't do anything since our child was a minor. So we learned after several attempts at seeking help from the authorities that we weren't going to get help there, which was a very sad, sad realization. Eventually, upon one occasion, we did need to call the police for um, abuse against a younger sibling. And that turned out a little bit differently, but I'm back up just a minute and say, we had repeatedly tried to seek our, to have our child see a therapist, a counselor, somebody to talk to, somebody to get help from. He would repeatedly refuse. We had got names from our pediatrician of recommended counselors, therapists, um, but our child was adamant that they would not go or see or talk to anyone. Eventually, the, the abuse in the home, the physical, the verbal abuse was so extensive when you're told on a regular basis that you're hated, that they want to kill you. Um, when knives disappear out of the kitchen drawer, when they pretend to hold up a gun and at the dining table as you're sitting eating are pretending to go around the table shooting everyone, laughing almost manically perhaps, I don't know, just in a very creepy way. Um, as if this was all funny stuff. And yet when confronted about these things would always declare that they were just playing, but these aren't ways to play. And it was scary, it was scary for everyone. Eventually we had tried everything we knew to try, the refusal of counseling, the refusal of any help and his escalation of behaviors had become so great. And so at one point he, assaulted a younger sibling, we called the police and only then, because he had assaulted a younger sibling, would the police intervene. Our child was removed, it was heartbreaking, he was arrested, however that was short-lived. Um, prior to this, we had sent our child to a therapeutic boarding school. Um, we gave him no notice because he had also taken to running away. He would erupt, cause harm in the home, 
break things, physically hurt people, and then would run away. So we knew that if he knew he was going somewhere that he would probably run away and it could be even more dangerous. We transported him to a therapeutic boarding school. At the boarding school, he did fairly well. We, we spoke weekly, we wrote weekly, we um, visited him for chunks of time, like for a week um, and so forth. And during our visits, things were great. Um, we talked extensively with our child during those visits, working through things, um, issues, anything he perceived that we had done wrong. We talked through, we you know, apologized for things, even if they were things that we hadn't done, but apologized if we in any way had done something to make him feel that way or to um, cause him to feel unsettled at all. We had great times together during those times. Um, his program thought he was doing much better. Um, although he had engaged in a very small bit of counseling in the program, of course, there was all day, every day sort of counseling interwoven. However, like the therapy sessions, um, he had done some, but he had pretty much kind of shut down and wouldn't do much of those, which um, was challenging. Um, at the same time, COVID kicked in and that changed how a lot of things could go on. Eventually we, it was just beyond our means to continue um, to have him there. There had been, everyone had thought they had seen improvements. So we decided to bring him home. Once he arrived home, he pretty much came in the door and within a very short amount of time, laughed in our faces and told us, ha ha, I fooled everyone. And you're going to regret what you've done. And from that moment, things kicked in, multiplied from what they were, the horror before he had gone to um, therapeutic boarding school. The tales that would be told of what went on at boarding school, I don't doubt that there were some things that were not the best because you're with a group of kids who are very challenging. However, I know for a fact that many of the stories told were complete lies um, from talking to staff, from knowing that things were videoed um, at the boarding school. He had learned, he had learned one thing at boarding school that if he was physical, he could get arrested and things could go in a wrong direction. But his verbal abuse and his threats and his refusal to follow any rules or guidelines of the home were so extreme. So that is where he ended up assaulting a younger sibling being arrested and then removed from the home by the police. However, once again, unfortunately, due to just systems that are failed all around, that don't understand, that don't support parents, um, basically nothing came of it. He had no real true consequences from it, except the fact that he was removed from our home um, and that we could not let him come back into the home for the safety of everyone else because his actions and words were that damaging. He would uh, push me down the stairs where nobody could see, there was always a very much a um, a guard to be sure that no one could see what was going on. 
as my child would shove me down the stairs. And then as I'm, you can hear me fumbling to try to find my footing so I don't fall all the way down the stairs. My child would stand there out of sight of everybody and, you know, yell out at me that I had pushed him down the stairs, which was completely the opposite situation. I don't know we will ever truly recover from the damage it has done to our family, the damage it has done to younger siblings as they were threatened repeatedly that if they didn't lie and tell stories about their parents, that they would be hurt. As our child very much uh, was never officially diagnosed because he continued to refuse his treatment. I don't know where his life will go because when it's not receiving help, not receiving proper help. There are many people that are willing to take the word of a child in these extreme situations and take every word they say is truth without ever checking to see if what they're saying is truth. I don't know what will happen if our systems aren't changed. In my state of Massachusetts, what I have experienced is that parents are always guilty until or if they can prove themselves innocent. However, the time to prove yourself innocent never seems to come. You can jump through hoops repeatedly and you never seem to get there. Children's court-appointed attorneys take what these children say and I understand it's a attorney's job to advocate for their client but something needs to change so that these children who have great great challenges have a chance in life because with no interventions with no support for the parents who are painstakingly and diligently working to try to help a child and then being blamed and harassed. Those children are only gonna end up in worse situations. When children are thrown into residential treatment programs, from my experience, what we are seeing is that they are simply medicated, heavily medicated which the state seems to approve of and push for. We, we've fought against some of those things when there has never been um, a diagnosis or um, a need for certain medications to just simply go into that is, is alarming. Many of the residential facilities that we've experienced um, the children are in more a more agitated state than ever because the chaos that surrounds them is so great. To see a child with their only hope of being in a residential until they turn 18 and they can leave the state, leave the state's care is heartbreaking. It's not what I would wish for any child of mine. However, we're not given the choice many times. It's beyond heartbreaking to have to make a decision. To let your child go. Because the systems that should be protecting them and you are so failed that it's not safe. 
child to parent abuse is something I never would have thought of before. It's something I'm sure I have wrongly in the past heard of and thought that it must not be real or that the parents must have done something. However, I have sadly learned that though we never claim to be perfect parents, and though there are times we wish we hadn't responded in the way we did or spoken in the way we did or whatever, that we are human and we make mistakes, we apologize for those, but that when you're in an extreme situation of feeling like you are fighting for your life, trying to protect your life, trying to protect your other children's lives. Those are scary times. And child to parent abuse is real. I don't know what all the answers are. I don't have much hope. <laughs> that there will be change anytime in the near future from what I have seen this past couple of years. But I do hope that in some small way, by sharing just a snippet of my story that others might see and truly listen and understand that it is real, that a child can be so challenged because of the traumas that they've experienced in their younger lives or well there are many many reasons why things happen but due to those things that sometimes children abuse adults they abuse parents and there needs to be protections all the way around and I just hope that somehow you will listen to this ponder it. I think we need to be contacting our legislators on a regular basis, being a noisy gong, little gong in their ear, reminding them of what's important. I think our child protection agencies desperately need oversight here in Massachusetts. The need for oversight is greater than I could have ever imagined. And until some of these things begin to happen, I don't think there's much hope for many of these children. They're not gonna get what they need and they're gonna grow up. They're not gonna stop growing. They're not gonna stay young and they're gonna end up in our jails. They're gonna end up in detentions. They're gonna end up in horrible situations. They're gonna injure people, harm people. It's real and it's scary. And we need to be fervently fighting for our kids that they can get what they need. The people who have authority and have the ability to make change, that they will listen, that they will seek to do the hard thing and change. I'm Katie Rose. I'm the founder and president of Attached Families, Inc. I am a mother of two beautiful boys that I adopted from foster care who, due to their own demons issues, they spent 10 years um being violent in some way. Most people talk about domestic violence and they don't include the fact that there is child to parent violence. And it happens every day in America to thousands and thousands of families who are ashamed or blamed or isolating themselves because they don't know what else to do. Most families who reach out for help and ask for help are somehow hurt in that process. They become blamed or threatened that they'll lose their other children simply for speaking out and looking for help. It is my hope 
that love connecting and partnering and collaborating with these amazing other organizations that we can bring awareness to society that this is happening and something needs to change. It is no longer okay to say that the systems are broken and go on with our day. We must do something to fix it.